Why? Wow, Why? look at that hair. That's beautiful. You're a beautiful man, John Dalton. Well, thank you, John Darley. That's very, uh, that's very kind of you to say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John Dalton and John Darley speaking with each other. I love the, the similarities and names there. <laughs> very right? good. That yes. is neat. Yep. Yeah, when people um, sent in their questions, um, because our names are the same, it's like, a, is he asking for me or for? Oh, no, it's for John. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, now, if you're listening, I am talking to John Darley in Utah. I've got that right. I you're in Utah. Yes, that's correct. American Fork, Utah. American American Fork. That's the name of the place, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, we bought a we bought a home here last uh, spring, and so this is this is where we're planted. Right, and what's American Fork is quite a distinctive name. Is there something behind that, or no? I mean, uh, it's pretty close to, you know, a bunch of areas, and you know, it's really close to Highland and Pleasant Grove, and um, you know, there, there's a lot, lot of different names in Utah Valley. Uh, there's right. actually a lot of great, great artists in the area. I, I think I remember, I, I remember listening to a interview with Mary Sawyer, Sauer. I, I, yes. you know, I can't remember exactly. I always mess Sour, up her last yeah. name, but um, yeah, she's just a few miles away. And, um, oh, okay. you know, there's a, there's a sculptor down the street from me, Ben Hammond. He's really great. And uh, Howard Lyon, he's a, he's a good artist and his wife as well. And, so there's a lot of artists around this area for whatever reason, you know, it's kind of, kind of a fun place to be. Oh, good. Um, yeah. American fork conjures up this, uh, image of like a big fork in the road or something like that. Is there, or was yeah. there? <laughs> I don't know. You know, maybe there was at one point, you know, maybe, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I got to look into it. That sounds like an interesting idea. Um, okay, so uh, just to give you a time context for our conversation, today's Wednesday, the 18th of January, uh, 2023. So we are already well into <laughs> 2023. Um, now, John, for someone listening who hasn't seen your work, how would you describe your paintings? Yeah, you know, I paint people, um, lots of portraits, uh, portrait commissions have been uh, a thing I've been doing quite often as of late. Um, but uh, figurative work is my emphasis. I, I love painting people. Um, and I, uh, when I, and I'll, I'll oftentimes take the human subject and tell stories um, with uh, various paintings, um, and even with commission work, um, I'm diving into, you know, a, a psychological narrative when I'm painting an individual. Um, I think, I don't know, have you ever, have you ever had this, this, um, this moment where you'll look at somebody and you'll think about who they are and and attributes about them and maybe what they've experienced within maybe a split second. Um, that's somewhat I, what I like to do uh, when I take on portrait commissions and I talk to a client or, or somebody who I'm going to be painting and try to get to know them quickly and um, develop a narrative around their personality and what I see as I um, get to know them and and become more familiar with them. And then on the other side, there's, you know, these more personal stories that I like to tell um, with some more narrative figurative work that I'll, I'll paint. Um, that's just, you know, really about, about me um, and what I'm feeling or experiencing that I can't really articulate very well um so i guess to wrap that all up i would say um i paint people 
um, and I, I paint stories. Very good. People and stories and people's stories. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, just to put your sensibilities, your artistic sensibilities in context, who are your um, artistic heroes or influences? And are they all painters or, they, or does it spread, spread out further than that? I mean, there's so many. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I, I guess maybe some of the less, uh, less obvious ones would be um, Sergio Leone, uh, you know, some of those Italian Western movies from the sixties and seventies. Yeah. Um, I, I absolutely love his work. Um, in particular, you know, when you watch some of his films, I love what he does with, uh, hit faces, his close up face camera work is phenomenal. Um, you can get so much emotion and, these micro indications of what these actors or, or characters in the story might be thinking and feeling. Um, and you get to see it real close and in personal. <laughs> I, I just love it. I just can't, I can't get over it. I mean, I'm probably one of the, you know, most commonly known films of his is um or at least one of my favorites is is the good the bad and the ugly have you have you seen that before i have um you know i have that last scene where there's you know the standoff uh, between the three characters um it's like i mean i think it's like 10 minutes of just close-up face shots of these <laughs> <laughs> these guys you know uh about to have a shootout over this dug up treasure and um the tension and the build-up um that he does with those face shots i think is just fantastic who are the actors again is levi and cleef clint eastwood and ernest Borg? You know, no not i ernest can't remember Borg. i can't remember the the um oh lee i wallach i think is his name or Lee Wong, oh. something like that. I think I think that's he's the third guy. Oh, was okay. I right about the the okay. first two? Clint Eastwood and, yes. and um, Lee Van Cleef. I believe so. Um, Lee Van Cleef you know, my... is such an unusual face. He's so pointy, right? <laughs> His right. Face is so he, he plays, angular. He plays a villain in so many of those movies, those uh, Italian Western movies, um, and I think it's because of that those angular, more sharp, yeah, sharp right. features, you know. Yeah. But my favorite, I think one of my favorite characters in that movie is um, the ugly, right? Uh, Clinton, Clinton Eastwood's classic, but um, I mean, just the character and and how, um, I mean, his story is just a little bit more hard to pin down. Um, and I think he does a great job at relaying that to, to the audience. And I, I you know, I, re I really enjoy Really enjoy that film all around, but in in terms of painters, um, I would definitely say um, I don't know. I think I think in more in terms of, of art movements, um, I think there's a, a beautiful time that um, around the uh, rent. Uh, Around the Impressionists, I feel like there was a magical time in art history. Um, people were becoming a little bit more bold. They were becoming, but but they had phenomenal drawing skills. Um, I think photography was starting to be introduced, and there's really some significant paintings. Um, and of course, it might be cl cliche to say, but because he's just so well known and to talk about, but of course, Michelangelo, um, I believe is perhaps the goat, uh, the greatest of all time. I, I, I think not only what he brought into the world, um, but uh, his example as an artist is just, I mean, I don't know. I mean, perhaps it's comparable, but, um, 
I mean, the guy, the guy built giants. He built buildings. <laughs> you know, uh, he, he, he. I, f- I feel like Leonardo will often get, you know, this um, rep as being this genius, and he was. And the, the sketchbooks are pretty amazing and and really cool and interesting. But again, Michael Michelangelo he he built giants. <laughs> you know, he was he was unbelievably interesting. He for, you know fortified Florence. Um, I mean, there's so many examples of his work ethic and his. Um, never-ending pursuit that I find incredibly uh, inspiring. Right. Anyone else now before I move on? (laughs) Well, yeah. Okay. So uh, what about contemporary? Can we talk about contemporary? Yeah. Painters? People are... um, uh, I would definitely have to add into the mix um, odd, Odd Nerd Room for sure. Um, All right. Yeah, and I have to add him in the, to the mix just because when I, when I look at his work, what I see is uh, a, a child, I, I suppose. Um, you know, I think all of us artists who a lot of us start when we're young and there's this innocence and there's this um, just raw feeling that can come out onto whatever we're working on. Um, I know for me, I would often draw how I felt or um, something to have control, um, a story that made me understand what it is I was going through or what it is I was seeing. Um, and when I look at his work, I, I see that that almost childlike innocence of trying to work out his, his life or his stories. And um, I don't think I would purchase one of his paintings, which is odd, you know, how can you respect an artist and not want to purchase his paintings? But regardless, I find his work incredibly inspiring because I see those stories. So. And you wouldn't want to purchase one because you wouldn't want to live with it or. Yeah, no, I just wouldn't want it in my home. Probably. I mean, that's not true. There are some, there are some, uh, some of his paintings I for sure would, would, uh, would buy, but there's a good portion of his work that I just wouldn't buy just because I wouldn't want that to maybe, maybe that story or that feeling to be in my home. Now, if I had like a gallery or a studio, hundred percent, I would probably buy his work, but uh, yeah. when I'm just thinking for like in my living room, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, I just, I just had to clarify cause he's a regular listener. I don't want him to be crushed. I don't want him ela- emailing me. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we got to get him on here sometime i'd love to hear what he has to say i you know i back it was i think it was like two years ago i was gonna go study with him um i was emailing with his wife and we were talking about it and uh the pandemic hit and so that really didn't happen um mm-hmm. and you know two kids later i don't think it's gonna happen at this stage in my life um but i'm a great great admirer of his just in terms of I feel like there is um he's really opening up himself onto that onto the canvas and um I think you know we we have those moments where we can feel that happening in our work and uh it's something I I am constantly pursuing yeah yeah, lovely. Anyone, any other contemporaries? Contemporary artists? Oh, well, I mean, there's always the people, you know, you study with who you admire, right? Um, you know, I, I first started with 
studied with Jeff Hine, and then I spent um, some time with the Grand Central Academy crew. Um, and all of those individuals are definitely people I reference for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how did it all start for you? Like where, when did you start your journey as an artist and then how did it go? How did you end up where you are now? Mm. Um, well, I mean, I guess it all starts when you're a kid. I, I think that's what most artists will say, you know, I've been drawing since I can remember or something like that, but, um, it's kind of true. Um, you know, my, my first memories of creating something was when I was in Florida. Um, it was a great, it was a great little childhood, you know, my, my parents, I'm the youngest of, of five and uh, there's a six year gap between me and the next youngest. Um, so my parents were kind of tired when I came into the world. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was, I was just really all over. I mean, my early childhood, I just remember being in the woods just all the time in Florida. We lived in Port Charlotte and um, it was, it was fantastic. I, yeah, I, I remember just making stuff all the time. Um, and I would carve these little animals out of this. I don't, I can't even remember what it was, but it was like this white, soft, stony substance, like a, like chalk or something. Um, and of course, you know, making weapons and axes and sticks and having these imaginary um, excursions and um, alligators everywhere. Uh, and, and it was, it was really a kind of a magical, magical upbringing. But on top of that, um, my mom, who's also an artist, she, uh, she was going to school at the time and she, I would watch what she was working on all of the time. And she would, you know, really give me the encouragement and, um, I suppose praise needed to keep me interested and engaged. And I, I remember I would have all her art books that were available to me and I would thumb through them. And um, I remember the first art book I, I would go through was, I think it, it was the artist Michael Whelan, some sci-fi fantasy artist. I just remember lots of, you know, dragons and spaceships and stuff like that. And uh, it was so cool. These worlds that I was seeing, you know, being created by these people. I, I And I just couldn't understand how people could do that. And, you know, how can you, how can you just create this? And it was the, um, it was a sense of creation that I was just so, hungry for and eager to know how that, that can be done. Um, and, uh, you know, after my family left Florida, you know, we, we, um, we kind of fell into some financial difficulties, you know, we was, we were pretty broke. I mean, my parents are fantastic parents and we just kind of had some bad luck <laughs> and, uh, we ended up having to live with relatives for a few years to move in, in when we moved to Utah. And um, it was pretty rough just because, you know, I was kind of school hopping. I went to five different elementary schools. Um, and that's, I mean, rough is relative. I can't say it's too rough. I mean, it was fine. I have a great family and my life's great, but um but when you do that, there's just some natural consequences where, you know, if you're new fairly frequently as a young kid, you're, you know, you have to figure out, you have to navigate that. Um, yeah. Right. And so one of those ways that I would navigate was through art and through creating these worlds that I would see my mom do and, and, uh, uh, that I would see in these art books she always had around and um and it absolutely was helpful you know I was I really my 
I remember as a child just being always so bored or, you know, <laughs> do you, I mean, do you, do you remember that? Or do you, can you relate? Oh to yeah. That yeah. Kind of feeling? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like you're like, Oh gosh, like what am I to do? Um, and I was always transferring from, you know, going from school to school and moving and, um, now there's now they're saying happen. that being bored is really good for you, like that kids oh, well, th these days are never bored, and it's changed the way they their brains are developing, and that there's um that a lot of creativity comes out of boredom. I don't oh. know if that's true. I didn't like it when I was a kid. Well, <laughs> but well, if that's the case, I, then I've, I'm, I'm I've seen be, that come I'm up a few used. times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was just I was just so bored all the time. Um, and my parents were just, they were, they, I mean, they, they were getting some back on their feet financially and they did, and they, they're, they're phenomenal. Um, and they did such a great job, but they were, n n I was let, I was pretty much kind of left on my own. Um, yeah. and so if I was bored, I had to figure out something to do. Um, and, uh, also, you know, it was the one thing that, you know, people notice, you know, it was something, so you, you, you kind of pursue the things you'll, um, your people can feel that you're excited about, you know, and, and people get interested as well and you can get other people on board. And I remember I would, you know, I'd, I'd be drawing at school and some other people would come and draw with me and we'd, there's this cool little synergy that we would get going. And um, it was a great, it was a great way to cope. Um, so anyways, yeah, I, I did that. And I, um, I did that through high school. Um, and I think I probably knew I was going to be an artist when I was about 11 or 12, though I didn't want to do it. Um, it's pretty I wasn't, I wasn't ignorant even then uh, about the challenges that kind of life present. Um, and those challenges are very real, you know, and I think maybe a lot of people from the outside look at an artist life and you know, they're like, oh, that's so cool. But uh, it's not for, it's not for the faint of heart, for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I could even feel that then. Also, to, to add to that as well, uh, when when we moved to Utah, my mom had a studio in downtown um, in Salt Lake City. It was at the Guthrie. It was called the Guthrie Building, and uh, I just hated school so much, and so I would always pretend I was sick. I, I think she probably knew, but I'd be like, "Oh man, you know, I'm sick. My stomach." Um, and so she'd take me to the studio and I'd see these projects that she was working on and she would, um, she'd be working on these portrait commissions. I remember she's, she did a bunch of um, state judges, um, doctors, uh, some kind of prominent families in the state. Um, as a matter of fact, I sometimes would, would find her paintings in these buildings here and there. Uh, I remember I think the second date I went on with my wife, we went to this piano recital and I, I go into this big like piano hall and I think it was at Utah State and I, I go in and the first thing I see are these paintings that look kind of familiar. I'm like, hey, I look close. I'm like, oh my, my goodness, that's my, that's my mom. Um, and so I grew up watching that and observing. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a classy yeah. second date. Piano right, recital, right. and oh, look at these paintings of my mother made. <laughs> oh, right. I think very so. good. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, we're married, so something worked. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that was all part of the mix. Is um, was my my upbringing there, and and I tried to fight it for a long time. You know, I think I think when I went to college first, I went to like for accounting for maybe a, a year. It was the worst. Wow. I hated it. Yeah, it was. I don't know what I was, what I was thinking. I, you know, once we, once you get to like, I was, I was lost pretty early on. Once we got to like FIFO, LIFO, and average or whatever it was, I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm gone. You know. <laughs> um, and uh, but 
And were your parents, did, sorry, did you, did you, because your mother was an artist, she, like you, would have known like the very real, you know, what, what was involved. Did your parents encourage you uh, towards art or not? Hmm. You know, I definitely say they encouraged me, but it, it also was a little bit of, you know, if you're successful, it's on you. If you fail, it's on you kind of feeling and mentality. Um, yeah, right. You know, your, your failures and successfuls are your own. <laughs> a little bit is what the general message I received. But I definitely would say there was some encouragement. Absolutely. Um, just in my day-to-day -day living. And I will, will, will say, though, that my family is probably – you know, some of my biggest fans and critics, for sure. Uh, I get text messages all the time of how I need to change my paintings or something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Um, but, uh, yeah, but my, my mother, her, she was my introduction to Jeff Hine, whom I studied right. with for a number of years. And... Um, and when I went to him, I was, you know, I was like, yeah, it was my senior year of high school. And I was, you know, I, I never really had any, you know, you know, if you're, if you're a professional artist, it's likely that, you know, when you're high school, you know, you're really good. And, but then you get out into the real world and you're very, very much so. Uh, not considered by anybody. <laughs> You're not good. Um, and I remember he, he had me do a cast drawing to kind of test me out. And I, up to, to that point, I'd only drawn from my imagination completely, 100%. Um, and I loved it. And um, he had me do this cast drawing, and it was maybe like an hour long that I spent on it just really quick and, and impatient. And um, I go to him, I said, oh, you know, hey, I, I finished with this. You want to come check it out? And he's like, what, are, are you are you a prodigy or something? You're done already? And he looks at it and, you know, kind of rips it up. And he's like, well, you know, you're not bad. And I was like, what? <laughs> not bad? And um, there's something about that statement that was, really good for me because I responded, I, I respond well to that. Um, it was, I, I felt like it was a challenge a bit. And, um, for my personality, that is a positive thing. Um, and so, you know, I, I, um, I didn't study with him immediately after, um, you know, I did, I did some other things. I did some things. For, I, you know, I served a, a mission for my church. I, um, I went to a college, a year of college. Um, and then I met my wife whom was very, very encouraging and supportive of the idea of pursuing a career in art, um, to become an artist and a painter. And if it wasn't for her, there's a good chance I would have tried, tried my hand at something else. Um, that support from her was re the real tipping point. Um, and she's, I mean, she's a brilliant woman, real brilliant woman um, in so many ways. I, I'm, I'm not gonna gross out our, our listeners, but um, she's phenomenal. And uh, she, she <laughs> the, the paintings I make are just as much her paintings as they are my paintings because of the wonderful um, encouragement and support she's been in, in my life and in my career. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. Um, so, so, so you did all those things and then you circled back to Jeff Hines. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so then I studied with him for a number of years. Um, and it was, a, it was great because, you know, you get to see a working artist um, doing their, doing their career, doing their, they're, um, you get to see the clients that come in, you get to see the process, you know, and at that time, I think he was working exclusively from life. And so I would work exclusively from life. 
um, and you know, I'd see the models come in, I'd see the collectors come in, and um, you know, you get a feel for the industry and in the and for the world. And um, you know, I don't think you really get that in art school very often. You know, maybe you'll learn how how to talk about art or how to draw, um, but the actual on the ground experience. I think was incredibly valuable, right? And he had a interesting method where it was, you know, you try an assignment or you have, you have a certain aptitude you have to demonstrate and you have to show it within five, five projects in a row, right? So maybe a, a basic block and drawing. Um, and if you got one wrong, or some, some sort of um, incorrect drawing error, you had to start again, or you had to start again. And so I saw a lot of people just drown and die, <laughs> you know, and that, they, that it, the, the method wasn't very good for them or their personality. And they just kind of floundered and wasted a lot of time. Um, but for me, it was, again, a great technique and method because, you know, I, I would just say to myself, I'm going to make him like this if it's the last thing I do, you know, <laughs> like you're going to like it and you aren't going to find anything. And, um, and I would, it was just this weird di dynamic where I'd be like, um, like feel kind of this aggression towards trying to complete these objectives but at the same time like this weird feeling of um like desire for affirmation <laughs> you know to, yeah. to get that 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 approval um and that was that was great that was a a, a fantastic experience and uh, we're great friends to this day. And um, after studying with him for a number of years, I, I went in to the Grand Central Academy in New York City and did their drawing program. Um, mostly because I would see the kind of work that would come out from these, uh, from, from this atelier. And I would again, get so upset that these figure drawings are so good. And, um, and I, I was working, I, I was working so hard, you know, I would, I would work, you know, 12, 14, 16 hours to try to improve my abilities and my skill. And, but, you know, I'd see these people go into this program for, you know, for a year. And then there's these figure drawings that are really great. Now, Obviously, there's more to art than fi good figure drawings, right? Um, there's quite a bit, but at that stage, it was definitely. I knew I, I definitely knew I need, wanted to draw people. I wanted to do portraits. I wanted to do uh, narrative, figurative work, um, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to get there unless I upped my game on my figure drawings. And so, we sold everything we had, and. Uh, I, I we flew I flew into New York, and I had like three days to find a, an apartment. And um, my wife, she was still in Utah. She was like looking at apartments. She was throwing them, throwing them at me. And I remember I was able to get an apartment that was 200 square feet, about. Um, and it was, uh, it was in Woodside, Queens, which. I, I'm a big fan of the neighborhood. If anyone lives there, shout out to Woodside Queens. Um, and we're, I was able to land, land it within a day and a half without a broker. And uh, we and we just were really, really scrappy about getting our finances together and, and being able to spend the time that we needed uh, in New York to get where I wanted to go. And it was totally worth it. Um, that school definitely has some great resources for people who want to pursue drawing the figure. Um, 
I mean, I mean, I'm sure you've had, I mean, you have Colleen Berry on here and some other, Gregory Morton. Yep. So yeah. Yep. So yeah, obviously you're familiar with it and, and kind of know a little bit about that, but I mean, I was, I was able to have access to a live model eight hours a day, which that alone is huge for somebody yeah. who wants to draw the figure, you know, I mean, a lot of places you get well, maybe three hours, a couple of days a week or something like that. And, and it wasn't all only just the grand central Academy. I, you know, I also went to the art students league and did figure drawing there. And, and, um, that was a, a great experience. And I worked incredibly hard and, and that's not to brag or toot my own horn. I don't even know if it was beneficial, but, um, but I would get, I'd get up, I would go, I'd get up at 6.30, I'd get to the studio at 8.30, and then I would, I'd go to school, I'd get back, you know, it'd end at, we'd have a half an hour for lunch, you know, it'd end at five, I'd take about a half an hour, an hour for dinner, and then I would continue to do still life painting into the night until the school closed and there's well, I can't remember his name I think his name was John John Brody or something and he would close the school and sometimes he'd stay even later so sometimes it'd be like 11 even though I don't think he was supposed to um and I would just rinse and repeat I did that you know six days a week um sat I mean on Saturdays I didn't do that but I would, I would go to I would study I remember I studied with Greg often Gregory Morrison often on Saturday and um yeah, I, I mean, by the end of it, I, I'm not sure it was beneficial, but I knew that I was there. I was in this place where there's an incredible amount of energy and learning to be had. And I wanted to get everything I could while I had the opportunity to do so. Because I knew that, you know, finances are limited. I mean, when we came home, I think we had like $1,500 left. Um, and I did not want to waste one second of it. And yeah. so um, I just collected as much information as I could. I started getting kind of like, I don't know what it was, but I started having this weird stuff started happening with my body by the end of it. You know, I remember my hands would go numb and I would have these weird things with my face happen where my face would start getting numb. And I went to a doctor trying to figure out what it was. I thought maybe I was having these allergic reactions and, uh, they're like, it's, it's in your head. It's like a psychological thing. And it's so weird because I wasn't like stressed out or freaking out or anything. I was just, um, I think my body was staying, like telling me that I needed to kind of slow down and rest or something like that. Yeah. But right. It, 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 you know, have you ever had something like that happen? You know, you push yourself and then there's like these physical manifestations. Uh, not, that extreme but i i certainly know when i'm when i'm tired or when i need when i haven't had enough sleep i definitely yeah. know that yeah and on top of that i gained a ton of weight you know i i think i i had to have put on like maybe maybe 25 pounds or something like that um which is weird because you think in new york you're all you're walking around and such but i think um i think i was I was pushing it a bit. It took took some time for my body to kind of, you know, uh, regenerate. <laughs> yeah. How long were you there for altogether? One year, and that One was a big intense big, year. <laughs> big reason why I was hitting it as hard as I could. And I mean, I think when I interviewed with Jacob or Justine, I think I told them I might want to because they, they they broke they broke up the program where it's like one year for drawing and one year for painting and then if you want you can do two more years of um just working on portfolio work uh, i don't know if they've changed it but that's how it was when i went there and i had studied with jeff for a number of years um my full you know education was five years as, as exclusively as a student. 
And so, um, so I was so excited when they did that because I knew that my finances, our, our finances were not capable of maintaining New York, which is crazy. Cause I, I met so many people who like weren't worried about it, you know, and were, you know, had finances were taken care of and I would see them just waste it. And it drove me crazy. You know, I was like, you guys, you have no idea how valuable this is. And you're just being casual, you know, because there's so many people who would just, I mean, sacrifice so much to just go over there to just see the Met, you know, and to, 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 to be a part of that and to experience that. And, um, and Utah is, has a abnormal amount of really talented artists in my opinion, but I would not say that there is an abnormal amount of, you know, huge museums you can go to. Um, and maybe, I mean, maybe that's the reason, maybe, maybe that culture and that, that artwork, when you don't have it around you as much makes it even that more valuable and interesting and uh, yeah. engaging. No, I mean that's a, that's a thought. That's an idea. Maybe maybe these more agrarian societies are you know experience you know, seeing the David, and uh, maybe that impact is I don't know. That's just speculating. But um, needless to say, we finished that year um, again. As I said, with fifteen hundred dollars left, <laughs> and um, and I was just terrified. You know, because, um, you know, it's like time to be, time to be an artist. You know? Yeah. <laughs> right. You're like, what do you do? You know, I did all this school where there's this structure and, and uh, these teachers critiquing you. And now you have to go out there and make money and say something with your work or at least reveal, you know, at least reveal something. And, um, you know, it's an incredibly difficult um, to handle those emotions uh, if you're trying to be a responsible person um, or or at least not um, at least make your in-laws proud. <laughs> you know, I, I was just, <laughs> I kept on thinking about my in-laws like, and they're all wonderful and very supportive and fantastic, but I just wanted them to feel confident that um, their daughter and sister made a good choice marrying me. <laughs> you know, so I'm like, how yeah. am I gonna, how am I gonna do this? Um, and really, I just got lucky to be, to be honest. You know, I um, I was doing, you know, a couple commissions. Um, that were, you know, for like a few thousand bucks. Um, and it was nothing. It wasn't, I mean, it was, it wasn't, you, you can't make a living doing that. Um, but I remember, I remember it so distinctly. My wife came into my studio and she says to me, well, we're pregnant you know, and, and she shows me a little pregnancy test and it was, have you ever, have you ever had those moments, John, where you're, in, where you're like dreaming and like something really intense happens in the dream and you wake up and you're like, <clears throat> <laughs> you know, that like shock, you yep. know, um, <laughs> that definitely happened. But what was really cool was a half an hour from her telling me that I got an email um, that ended up being, you know, a thirty thousand dollar commission, and then quickly thereafter, you know, we got you know twenty thousand, ten, and it just like happened. Really, there there was no there was no like strategy. It really, honestly, for me. 
was, at least at that beginning, was luck, providence, whatever you want to call it. It gave me the confidence to say, you know, this is this is real. You can make a living doing this. Yeah. Um, and obviously, there's been up and downs, but that that took me um, from freaking out to being like, Hey, this is, this is a thing that can be done. Yeah. And this can, this can happen. And yeah, this is the path that I'm going down and I'm going to continue with this crazy idea that, that I've had since I was a kid, um, to tell stories and to make these relics, um, for other people. And, uh, that was really kind of the start. Um, and uh, five years later, we're here in American Fork, bought our first home in spring. And uh, I renovated the garage for my studio and plan on expanding it when we can afford to do so. And that's that's where I am. Yeah, that's great. It's lovely. Um, it reminds me of my mother, actually, because my mother used to always say babies bring their own luck. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. I agree with that. Um, yeah, I I don't know why I got lucky on that first year, but I definitely think I did. Um, and I see a lot of very talented artists who don't seem to have those things happen for whatever reason. Um, and I don't know what to say to that other than I'm just grateful. And and if you do, if you do have those, let's call them lucky or lucky moments, or let's say, let's say you're one of the, you know, one of these people in New York who can uh, have their, um, you know, have a sweet trust fund or something like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it's really important to show gratitude by being being your best and doing everything you can um, to to show appreciation for either those who sacrificed for you or you know whatever might have fallen in your lap um, you know you, you, you can't you can't let it go to waste yeah I mean it's just a great thing to do anyway for yourself is right? to, be great, to be to be grateful you know it's just so yeah. it really oils the wheels of life when you're grateful right. for breathing your body sunshine and lucky wonderful lucky serendipitous things like you said but um the more grateful i am the more grateful i am <laughs> right yeah well i'm grateful for you john I'm grateful, well, I'm grateful uh, for you, for John, your, as well. For your podcast, <laughs> for your show. Oh, now, um, you. well, I, d I don't want to change the subject for me, but I, but when maybe you have some, a, f a few more questions, but I am curious to know how you got your start with this podcast because, you know, I've been looking through the episodes and just so, so many good painters have been on here and have shared so many uh, little little treasures of uh, or or, or um, I don't know little little bits of insight that I've remembered you know even 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 now as I'm painting I, I I can I'll reflect and think about oh yeah you know this person said this or this person said that and I apply it to my career or my painting and I, I'm curious on what gave you this leap into podcasting um well i'm curious which ones stand out for you just to, just while you're saying that like what little little nuggets have stayed in your head so i i really appreciated the um matter of fact i emailed her uh colleen berry's episode when you mm -hmm. first had her on um and, and i studied with colleen uh when 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 I was at GCA and she was, she would critique my, my work often. And, but for some reason, you know, it was very, it wasn't like, we weren't, we weren't friends. <laughs> you know, I was just like a student 
student um, pupil relationship or a teacher student relationship. And, um, but hearing her kind of divulge her true and sincere thoughts about art and where she was with her career at the time. That was, I mean, that was cool. Cause that was like at a um, kind of, it seemed like a crossroads for her when she was transitioning from strict, a little bit more strict realism to, um, you know, a little bit more abstraction with her work. And so, um, and it was funny too, cause I felt like she was speaking somewhat negatively about the Grand Central Academy, which I thought was odd because, you know, she teaches there and they pay her and, you know, and, 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 and especially there, you know, we go to these, you go to these ateliers, there's these weird, you almost feel like you're joining a cult a little bit, you know, um, <laughs> right? I mean, look, I mean, I, I am, you know, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, of Latter-day Saints, I'm a Mormon, I went on a mission, people told me, you know, I was in a cult all the time, you know, you get yelled at, eggs thrown at you, you're in a cult, but I actually never felt like I was in a cult until I joined in the Sunday, <laughs> right? Like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, this is like That's a real cult, yeah, like, you know, I mean, it was, it's for real. It, and it was so weird that it was so pre prevalent. Um, but so so when I heard her kind of open up and speak that way, it was so refreshing because I was like, oh, look, you know, people can have, because it's art, right? I mean, art, my religion is my religion. Art is part of my soul and part of my person and part of, part of me but it's not it's not my religion let's put it that way which it might be weird to say and you know I could I could disagree with myself if you know if I were to have a debate with myself but um <laughs> that's how I was that's how I was feeling about it I was like man this is because there would be these like moments where people would talk negatively about you know these phenomenal artists and I didn't understand it because I was like you know we're students we're just figuring this out you know I heard I heard people talk smack on like Stephen Assail or Jeremy Lipking or and I just could not wrap my mind around why that was cool like why I'm like you are not very good especially in comparison to these individuals, why are you speaking this way about them? Um, I mean, and you need to be able to bring it before you can, I guess, talk smack <laughs> you know, of, of these other yeah. painters. And it, it felt like it was like cool, right? And, you know, right. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of art schools and maybe, maybe that's just how art students are. Like maybe it's like just part of the developmenting, develop, developmental process of, of an artist and a painter, um, but I didn't understand what was happening there. And mm -hmm. so to see her open up and be a human and talk about things that um, seemed self-evident uh, was good, you know, and I enjoyed that aspect, um, breaking away from this like dogmatic feeling. Now, I hope this doesn't come off as you know, disrespectful or that I don't like that school because that's, there's nothing further from the truth. I think the Grand Central Academy, I think Jeff Hines program, I think they are phenomenal programs and anybody, if you can get in them, um, I mean, suck up everything you can because there's so much knowledge uh, to be had. Um, and I didn't, I never really heard I mean, that's not always true, but most of the comments out here were for students, right? Um, with maybe a few exceptions. But um, but that podcast was pretty fantastic. And then, um, let's think, there's another one I heard recently. 
and I'm I'm hesitating on saying it just because I I'm so I'm worried I'll butcher his name. Um, Pov Edward Povey 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 yes Povey uh, yeah uh, po sorry sorry Povey <laughs> uh, but his way of articulating his artwork and his craft really yeah. took me to school really took me to school um i'm a, i'm i'm a i'm a bit of a hermit i don't really go out and talk to people other than my family because just frankly time doesn't really allow a lot of it i, I have two children two sons and um between painting and managing the home and you know fixing the car whatever has to be done you know I'm at a stage in life where time is very, very limited. I mean, I'm, I'm like changing diapers and eating sandwiches at the same time, you know? And, um, <laughs> and so I'm, not, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not like really um, mingling with the public and having these opportunities like I am right now um, to speak about my work or my philosophies on art or life in general. Yeah. Um, but being able to have other people to listen to and speak um, makes you feel less lonely in, in, in the art world anyways, or f makes you feel like you're having a conversation. And even if you aren't speaking, having an input within that conversation, you, you might, you are in your head, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and well, uh, I... he, he was so articulate. I, I really enjoyed what he had to say. He was, yeah. God, I could have listened to him all day. So, and and he wasn't just saying the same stuff that other people say. He had very unusual perspectives on pretty much everything, most things, anyway. He's lovely. Um, it's it's nice to hear you say that because I'm very conscious of the third person in the conversation. Um, like I never think of an audience, you know. Because I don't think audiences, it's not for how podcasts work. There's only ever three, like in, in an interview kind of a podcast, there's only ever three people involved. There's me, there's you, and then there's the third person, the person who's listening. So they're like the silent person. Uh, but they're, I'm very conscious of them in, in the conversation. Uh, so it's nice that you felt like that you were part of the conversation because that's certainly something I aim for. Um it's it, the this is my second podcast i started podcasting when podcasting happened first which would have been in 2006 and it was it was to, it was uh, in conjunction with the book i'd written at the time which is called why do we get sick why do we get better it's available on amazon if you're listening um and that podcast was as podcasting was just blown up at the time and it was like, yeah, I'll do a podcast. And I, I, I did some videos and whatever. But then podcasting died. And I kind of went, yeah, okay. Well, it was that was fun for a while, but and it just kind of faded away. And then I was um I'd written another book called May and Noise, available on Amazon. And it's an audio version of it as well. Um if you're listening, you want to go and listen to that. Um and I I thought um, yeah, I think I'll do a podcast with that. Um, just to kind of talk a little bit more about some of the things that I talked about in that in that book. And the um, my website was, you know, it's johndalton.me. And when you set up a WordPress website, they, they give you the option of having a subtitle. So um, I thought, okay. And that's when I put in the gently does it because I kind of thought it was kind of funny and descriptive. Uh, because I think being gentle in the world is a good thing. So um, the, when I started the podcast, which was very low key, uh, you know, I just it just naturally went through that website, um, and the first twelve episodes were ju are just me talking. I, I videoed them as well, so they're on YouTube as well. And then I didn't do anything for about. I don't know, four or five months, I didn't have any episodes, but I was in the studio myself and I was listening to people. I was listening to podcasts and there were interviews 
And I thought, yeah, that sounds like fun. That sounds like something that would be good to do. And initially I thought, well, the three things that I'm interested in are, you know, consciousness, reality, spirituality, that sort of things, um, natural health and art. So those are the people I'll reach out to, those those three kind of areas. And it's, it's pretty much as soon as I started this interviewing people, it the podcast took on a life of its own and it just charged forwards towards art um, because the uh, I found it very difficult to organize tea up with the spirituality people or the consciousness people or the health people it just was just problematic but the art people no problem so mm. if you look at the very very early episodes you'll see some people like that you know like, like the, they're not artists really at mm. all um, but very quickly it became all about artists and very quickly it became about figurative artists because that's what I was interested in. And it just pretty much took off from there and it just has stay, stayed like that ever since. Why did you, um, why did you pursue figurative art or, or what, what sparked your interest in that? Insecurity. Uh, of, <laughs> Insecurity, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> my own insecurity um well when you're saying oh like everyone's stories the same they're all great at good you know drawing as a kid i wasn't very good at drawing as a kid my sister was very good at drawing as a kid and okay. um like i'm one of six so in the family my sister got labeled as the artist um she's a little bit older than me so and i i, I wasn't that good at drawing and i'm a little bit dyslexic and I'm left-handed and you know my, my writing is not very good and we're, you know it was around the time when they were they weren't beating children out of being left-handed but it was frowned upon and it was discouraged and I would say that that influenced um you know like some people have lovely stories about oh there was this you know Mr. Jones the teacher and he just kind of took me under his wing and encouraged me and you know and I, I Mm -hmm. I didn't sure. have that at all. I had the opposite. <laughs> so interesting. I I think um, like uh, at some point I you know because I worked around art a lot. Like I worked in animation and I was around fantastic artists, which just made it just kind of reinforce that thing of like that I am not actually that good. Uh, mm -hmm. so eventually I just got sick of that and went, you know what, I'm just going to go and learn how to draw. And I went and, you know, did some, uh, bark drawing kind of very classical. I didn't even know it was classical at the time. I just stumbled into it. And, um, I was interested. I just wanted to sort of prove to myself that I could do it. Um, and mm -hmm. I, you know, the more I went into it, the more I discovered that there are painters living today who can paint you know fantastically like i can very clearly remember coming across um uh, an irish artist his work and um francis o'connor i think is his name and i felt physically ill when i saw his paintings first they were so good i was just it was it felt like a <sighs> kick in the in the stomach and um, it was just like my god a, a human being a living human being is yeah. doing that right now that's yeah, not know, something sure. in a museum that's that's a real person so i think that's that's what spurred it it was just like i want to know um and i want to talk to these people and hopefully it will rub off on me a little bit <laughs> mm, that's interesting that's interesting uh, what a great idea i mean what a fa fantastic i mean that's a little bit kind of what's happening today in the art world where artists are opening up their studios and taking on apprentices again, like, yeah. you know, in the, in the Renaissance. And I mean, what a great strategy too. Um, and it's great for everyone else listening because they get to kind of soak up that knowledge as, as well. Um, I, I, I'm also curious on, um, do you feel like, since you've started this podcast, your art has 
grown and improved? Is has this been a little bit like art church maybe at, at times where you feel inspired and and see application to your work? Yeah, uh, not so much art church, but certainly art school. Um, art like school. I feel like I've learned, you know, so much. Like uh, I've learned a, a lot. I learned and I've learned. And in a roundabout way, I've learned, initially I learned like lots of technical things. Um, but then the more artists I talked to, the more I learned, uh, I, did, I became a lot more at peace with the artist that I am as against the artist that I would, that I thought I was. Sure, sure. You know, I was, I think I was, before this interview, I, I was, or this podcast discussion chat, um, I was looking. I was looking at some of your f photography, um, and I was, you know, I, it, you know, there's some stirrings. Let's let's put it that way. I, I mean, <laughs> it, it was lovely. It was lovely. You had some yeah. stirrings. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> I liked it. Yeah, it was great. It really was. Yeah, um, oh, and I'm you. also, I also think, um, I just found your i don't know what's the word to put it or um i don't know meditative musings i mean how should i put that what should i say for these th or thoughts on spirituality i suppose or meditation um and this is the, the further that, emergence uh, podcast is it well i haven't listened to the podcast yet i okay. i just found your instagram um okay but I, I did see that you were doing, you're jumping in cold water recently. Is that, is that a new thing? Um, no, no, I did that all. I've been doing that all since, since around this time last year, actually. Yeah. Cold oh, cool. water immersion. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I just started doing that in the morning after I exercise a cold shower and, yeah. uh, I, I don't, I think I've been doing it because it's become, it's just a trendy thing. And uh, somebody <laughs> challenged me to do it <laughs> for a, a certain amount of time. And, uh, and I knew, but I knew, you know, I could, I could see that there was, um, there seemed to be, I think, I think I could tell though, that there was something about it that seemed appealing because it seemed like a really difficult thing to do. Um, and I said to myself, you know, if I do that after a workout, that's really going to get me up in the morning. You know, <laughs> that's really going to get you going. And yeah. that's been my experience so far is that, um, you know, maybe, I mean, you can throw out the coffee and, and uh, just take a cold shower and you're going to be, you're going to be up and ready to go real quick. You're going to you know? be wide awake. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, oh, it's been fun. I, I did one this morning, and I was, I was uh, thinking, well, at least I'm not in the whole lake like John Dalton. Yeah, yeah, it's a river. A river. We have a, there's a river on the property here, so it's great. That's awesome. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, God, I'm really enjoying this podcast. I've listened to a few now, and they're brilliant. And there's so many of them. And I've learned so much from listening to them. And you know what? If I met that John Dalton fellow in real life, I'd love to buy him a cup of tea and have a chat with him. I'd love to do that every month if I could. Well, now you can. The tea part, at least, because this podcast runs on cups of tea bought for me by people like you who listen to the podcast and send me the price of a cup of tea once a month through the Patreon account. That's patreon.com forward slash John Dalton gently does it. All one word. And if you're one of those people who already send me cups of tea through Patreon, thanks a million. The tea is lovely and I really appreciate it. Now, the great thing is that if you can't afford to send me the price of a cup of tea or you don't want to, that's fine. You still get exactly the same podcast for free. It's sort of an honor system where the people who can afford it and want to pay for the people who can't or don't want to. So it's all lovely. So if you'd like to send me a cup of tea once a month, you can do that through Patreon. I'd really appreciate it. It makes a huge difference to me. 
So, getting back to your paintings, how does the idea for a painting start for you? Um, like, how do you grasp those wispy bits of inspiration? Do you make little sketches? Are you a sketchbook person? Do you write things? Are you more written? Voice memos, thumbnails? What, what kind of thing? How do you record your ideas? Well, usually it's while I'm painting that I come up with ideas for paintings. Um, and I do everything you just mentioned, I do. Um, in not any particular um, routine fashion. But if I have a certain thing that I want to capture, yeah, I'll have a little text thread with myself and I'll throw it into that. Um, and then usually late at night when things are kind of calming down and I put the kid, we put the kids to bed and kind of winding down, I'll, I'll do little sketches um, and just look at the design of what I want to do. And it really does depend on the project. Um, you know, if it's a commissioned project, usually a portrait, um, I, it, it's a different process than it is for a non-commissioned project. Um, so a non-commissioned project is uh, me making lots of sketches, ideas, and designs, um, and thinking about how I'm feeling and how I really what I want to reveal. Um, and those, those sketches will, will take place. I'll make little cartoons. And then um, I, I, I'm going to just use one painting as an example. Um, I did uh, the, the, the painting Aegis which is, you know, of a woman holding a child. Mm -hmm. um, Great and, and she's wearing kind of kind of like a bonnet-like hat. Um, that painting, I had that idea for, for the idea for that painting for quite some time. And um, I had very specific uh, desires for the elements of the painting. I, I remember I went out to... Um, to different areas in southern Utah, looking for landscapes that I thought would would work, and um, we had a we had a babysitter who would help us out once in a while, um, whom is the model for that painting, and that baby she's holding is her child, and um, I knew that she would be perfect for the painting. And I would go online looking for specific clothing or, you know, ele specific elements that I wanted her to have uh, to, to relay this feeling. Um, but when I kind of, you know, when I, I put all these things into a bowl and when I kind of laid it all out, there's there a lot of things that just didn't work. Right, my landscape that I thought would work perfectly for this painting was all wrong for the feeling that I had, or for or, or for the feeling that I wanted. Um, the, the baby wrap that that the baby was originally wrapped in when I had, you know, her, her and her child come into my studio was not right. It wasn't going to work, um, and. Uh, some improvision just started taking place. You know, I, you know, you quickly find, a, um, you know, she, she, she was coming, she came into the studio and she had this um, wool looking blue sweater that we ended up wrapping the baby in instead. And um, the landscape, I remember I was stressing about the landscape element so much that I, I woke up at like, four in the morning I was just angsty and stressed about it and I just got in the car I said I told I you know I kissed my wife I said hey we gotta go I gotta go I don't know where I'm going but I gotta go I gotta figure this out <laughs> and I just left and I didn't know where I was going but I knew I wanted a better landscape because it wasn't conveying the the feeling or the message that I desired and I ended up like randomly and like just before you leave 
civilization in or um, a lot of more prominent towns in Utah Valley is like uh, around Nephi or Santa Quinn or something like that. And I just started walking through the mountains and looking and hunting. And um, I found this perfect area where it was right on these outskirts of where people were developing homes and, and then just tons of farms and nothing. And um, I saw this land being developed where there's new homes being built because for whatever reason, you know, it seems like the world is just starting to move here and home prices were shooting up and there's not enough houses for everybody because so many people are moving here and population is growing so much. Um, but I loved these elements of homes being developed and there's these telephone poles that I thought were just fantastic um, for the message that I, I wanted to relay and utilize. And, um, and it worked perfectly in terms of the color and how I wanted it to, to, to feel. So there was the initial um, just idea in your head, right? And a sketch, I did like a cartoon. And I worked with that composition for a while. Um, I think I originally wanted it to be uh, square. It wasn't until it didn't all click until I put it in a circle format um, that I was like, "This is this is this is good. This is this is what what I want." Um, and so, yeah, there's the initial idea. There's the sketches. There's the collection of information through photographs, through models, um, through props, um, and then the improvisate. You know, you you improvise. And it's probably, you're probably likely going to need to improvise. I don't think there's been any painting I've done where my original idea was exactly what I did <laughs> or went with, uh, because the painting yeah. calls for different elements and, and you have to obey that and pay attention to it. I've had plenty of paintings where I've tried to force them and um, it, it just, it doesn't turn out that great. Now, in terms of commission work, it's a different game in that I'm considering the individual and person and what I know about them and tailoring a piece to a family or an individual. And, um, and so, so I take those elements into account as opposed to um, maybe a, a, a painting that I'm trying to reveal my own personal stories or emotions. Yeah. Yeah. And is it always from life or do you, take photos of your live sessions or what's how do you work that way yeah i mean if i if you can work from life or if i can work from life at, you know i'm gonna do it um I, I i haven't had any person who's commissioned me um be willing to come in and sit well that's not true i did have one and they tried and then they bailed. <laughs> They're like, you know, I got stuff to do. So photographs for that. And if it's still life, absolutely. I don't understand why anyone would use photographs for still lifes because they aren't going anywhere. I mean, maybe there's some circumstances where I'd be helpful, but um, you can work from life, work from life. Um, but usually, I, I usually use photographs. Yeah, when I'm working with my references and um Sometimes with landscapes, I've landscape elements, I've gone on site and worked at it and looked at it, especially with the color. Um, but even then, um, just the the advantage of having a reference that doesn't go away is, is huge. Now, in terms of color, I think if you can get somebody to come in, or if I can get somebody to come in or go on site to a landscape. Um, Definitely, I definitely do that uh, as, as much as, you know, I can. Yeah. Do you do much on Photoshop or anything like that with like composite different elements or to make a master composite that you work from or? Um, yeah. Yeah. I use Photoshop. Uh, pretty basic. You know, um, I'm not, there's some painters now who are so good with it and get everything ready to go and 
and perfect and all those decisions are made right there on the computer. Um, I'm not one of those. Uh, I don't, I lack the, I lack the, the know-how. Uh, I worked exclusively from life um, as, you know, for five years as a student and, you know, Photoshop 101 was not part of my training. So I've really just had to figure it out and work with it to accomplish the goal of, um, you know, saying what I want to say. Yeah. Yeah. And do you do, um, color studies before you start the main painting? I have, uh huh. I don't always do it, but I have found it useful, um, uh, with a few particular paintings it can be it'd be interesting though because i, I found that sometimes a small color study when, when a painting is large it, the the feeling is very different as opposed to just being a th small little thumbnail yeah, um, right. but uh getting those getting those little at least basic decisions down and figured out is really helpful if something's really big like huge um, I'll even, I, I definitely will do a color study and premix paint, um, for large areas so that, you know, uh, I can have consistency, consistency within the painting and I'm not wasting, you know, there, there, there isn't these odd strokes uh, within different layers that I can have something nice and juicy and convenient and save time. Um, so yeah, if, if it's big, I think um, I think figuring out what what paint you're going to be using and having it in plentiful quantities is definitely an advantage for sure um, because then you get tricky. You have large areas. It's not necessarily harder in terms of like technicality. As a matter of fact, I would say larger paintings can be easier in a lot of ways. But just those big swaths of of paint can be a little tricky uh, if you aren't ready to go. Yeah. And what does the drawing phase look like? Um, do you work from your composite image that you made on Photoshop or do you draw straight on the canvas or how does that phase go? Yeah, it's always changing. So uh, Charles Barg method is what I use for a really long time in that you do a straight line block in drawing. Um, you know, some, some, some people call it a cartoon drawing and I work out all those problems, um, you know, within that drawing stage and I get a, a structural, um, roadmap for, for my work. Um, and after that, you know, I'll transfer that drawing to a painting surface, right? And I have that all figured out and then we start you know, laying down the paint. But recently, I've just been going into it, you know, just drawing straight up with the paint, almost like a uh, charcoal drawing um, and just working it out. Um, there, I mean, there's something that happened at like my 10... Or even before that, maybe like my nine year mark of, of painting and drawing where it just felt like it wasn't as much of a challenge. You know, I could have conversations and draw and it just wasn't, I mean, I still, I mean, I'm not saying that I'm, I've like, you know, I'm like, there is this like glorious, like, oh, you know, you can all of a sudden <laughs> be perfect or something like that. But it's it just doesn't take as much mental exertion as it did when I was a student. And um, and so I found that just throwing it down is it's kind of fun. There's some energy that goes into it. It's not as stiff always. And uh, that's what I've been doing so far. And um I mean, maybe there's some circumstances where I'll still do those cartoons, cartoon drawings or straight line block in drawings and transferring it. And when I teach, I do teach the Barg method as well, where we do those straight line block in drawings, because I think it's so important for students um, because there's so much to think about, right? I mean, when you're, when you're um, trying to 
consider um, you know accurate proportions and um, where these plane changes occur. Um, you know, it can take a lot of focus. And when you want to transition to rendering the form, right, and thinking about value and color and um, all these other obstacles, it's very advantageous to a new painter to consolidate focus, in my view. Um, when you when you have a solid drawing and then you start thinking about, you know, rendering the form or laying down paint and you have all those other elements you have to juggle with color, um, you, you, it's just one less thing to think about, right? And if you have to go back, you know, where you get all these layers on top of the painting and you're like, oh man, you know what, there's, there's a significant drawing error there. You have to go back and, and um, destroy st some of that structure. It can be sometimes detrimental where it will start feeling, you know, I, I'll, I'll, you can always tell kind of more amateur paintings because they'll they'll feel a little bit more gumby-ish, like they don't have structure to them. And um, and I, 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 I remember early on, I'd always have that problem where I'd try to make a, a, a drawing correction when I was pretty far along within the drawing itself. Um, and it would just make it gross and icky and, and, and ruin it, you know? Um, so I do think that that method is, that Charles Barg method is fa fantastic. And, um, and I, I still do use it sometimes, but uh, generally I just throw on paint on the canvas now. So that's how I'm doing it. Yeah. All right. Um, what do you like to paint on? you know, substrate wise? Well, um, I've been painting with egg tempera lately. And when, when I, with that, I, I like clay board. Um, it's very absorbent. Uh, so I really enjoy that surface. But with oil, always lead prime linen, 600L. Um, I get it from, what is it? New Traditions. It's really great it slips and slides and doesn't fight you um you know it's especially for if you're a landscape painter. i'm not a landscape painter but um you know when, when you have limited time you really don't want your painting surface to fight you at all so if you feel like there's this bite or there's it's just not working or moving like you want it to um yeah, I, that that lead prime linen will definitely not fight you and glide real nice. And always, uh, like never panels. You, you're not into panels at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I work on panels, um, uh, aluminum panels. Um, you know, I, I I enjoy some some dye bond panels. Um, yeah, I I like panels as well. I love how hard they are. That you know, the, the rigidness, um, and if they're prepared properly, uh, they can be great too. Yeah. I, I don't have any qualms with panels. I have a good few panel paintings as well in my studio. Right. And is there a grisaille phase of the painting or do you, from the videos I've watched, it doesn't look like there is, but maybe there is, I missed it. No, there is with my egg tempura paintings. I definitely do a, I don't know, maybe a quasi grisaille where I find where I just do a basic value, um, you know, get get my, my shapes blocked in in um, a basic value pattern laid down. I can, it dries so rapidly and quickly that I can start adding all of those other multiple layers on top of it. Um, and, you know, I find that seems to be appealing to me. But as for my oil paintings, no, no, no grisaille. I just go right into it all. I'll, it depends on, on the, the time period, but I used to just do my line drawing, transfer that line drawing, and then just paint right into it, start doing tiling. Um, and that, that line drawing is really great, though, for
for for those roadmap situations, not only for painting on, but um, but for your mind. You know, this is a little bit of a deviation from your question, but I just wanted to get back onto that line drawing topic because um, because I think uh, I mean there's I think it, within the realism world there's there's a lot of you know people who project um, their paintings. And, and just trace the, the, those projections and um, paint on top of it. Um, and I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm no like dogmatic purist, but I don't find that as effective because the, um, because of that, that drawing phase is not only giving you like a blueprint of what your painting is going to be, but it gives you a psychological blueprint in your head that's incredibly beneficial once you get into the painting process. Um, and uh, you know, I've I've had this I've had circumstances before where I've been critiquing somebody's line drawing or, or, or somebody who just finished their line drawing and and going into it, and it's sometimes difficult because I didn't really have all the thought behind why they made the decisions that they made or what they were considering, right? And so that that process of discovery within the drawing phase is um, is really important. Whether I mean I, I suppose it doesn't matter whether it's a line drawing or you're just going down and painting directly onto the canvas. You know you're doing big bold marks, but um, but I, I do find that that beginning stage to be probably the most important in any painting I do. So how do you do your transfer process then? So what I'll do is I'll do a um, an oil transfer where I'll just take my, my drawing um, and I will put it on the back of, or excuse me, I'll, I'll, I'll put paint on the back of my drawing and I'll attach it to the to my linen surface and I'll go over my drawing with a pen where, and that pushes the paint onto that linen surface, causing there to be marks and you'll know where your drawing is. So you're, you're essentially tracing your drawing now. Um, so it's one might say, Oh, you're, you're just tracing. But again, it's that point of your, the thought behind that block and drawing is where the money is. Right, you've 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 considered it, you've discovered it, you know you know what's going to happen, and kind of you've taken a uh, you, you've scoped out the land, and, and you, you're considering your battle plan, right? Um, and so and so so yeah, so that oil transfer is how I do it. Now um, you can even you know take it, you can even blow it up if you want to. Um, I've I, I've projected a drawing I've done smaller um, to a larger drawing for a charcoal drawing once, but I found I found that to be a little bit risky, even though it's it's your own drawing, right? And you're just you know putting your your drawing there. You've made that discovery. There there, there can be still be some distortion within that method. So as long as I I, I think the, the the safest method is to have a direct um, paper transfer, pa paper to, to linen or, or panel or whatever you're drawing on um, uh, surface and, and go over it with, and you can, there's lots of ways to transfer. You can use charcoal, oil paint, whatever, um, but you, you put it on the back of the surface of, of your drawing, go over it with a pen and your drawing's there. Um, if, if people are curious about it, you can always just look it up on YouTube, you know, Re Renaissance transfer method or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, Julie Hightower Ryle on Instagram says, how many layers of paint and or glaze scumbles uh, do you typically do for a painting and how long do they usually take? Uh, I would say there's an initially two layers, right? And then, and then I would say there's a, there's accents after I do those two layers um, where I'll use um, small bits of paint to just give accents and pop to, to my painting. And I'll use maybe some pointillism in, in certain sections. 
or you know dashes um, here and there to uh, give that final pop. Yeah. So um, just again from looking at the your um, time lapses on your Instagram, um, you, it seems kind of a la prima the way you work to me. Is it, or are you kind of consciously thinking in terms of glazes? Um, I'm, I don't think in terms of glazes. Uh, I just kind of go for it. Um, I do. Uh, let's think. I do do lots of glazes on larger paintings. For whatever reason, it seems more. Um, it seems more advantageous. Glazes are really cool. Just or, or paint or I do I'll do a lot of glazes on paintings I haven't planned out very well. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right? um, I just find that I keep on wanting to to change uh, the tint of of what I'm working on, and and glazes can really be like almost Instagram filters, right? I mean, uh, you can unify a whole painting with a, a glaze if you if you need to. Um, or, you know, you need to make it darker. You'll lose a little bit of form when you glaze your work, but um, sometimes it can be worth it and you go back and recover the form if you have to. Um, but yeah, not not a ton, but I do, um, and it seems like I do often on paintings I don't plan very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your paintings remind me of the way Scott Waddell paints. You know, it's sort of starts in one like an eye or a nose and it seems to just grow fully formed out of that uh part you know is yeah um, yeah i mean he i mean he i think he even taught at the gca um yeah the idea is craw crawling across the form right we're just um we're we're Consolidate, it's again that idea of consolidating focus, right? Um, you, there's, there's an incredible amount of power that you can have when you um, narrow your vision and your focus, and you can get a ton of form out of a painting and out of your, your subject as you just narrow in the laser. Um, and there can be some disadvantages for sure. Uh, and there can be different schools of thoughts in, in, in some respects, but um, if you want to really uh, just nail form, I think consolidating your focus and having that laser can be a great way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Evan Thomas Lilly on Instagram. Said, oh, actually, you didn't answer the thing about how long they take. Julie's question about how long do your paintings take? Oh yeah, so like a basic small portrait, usually I'll work on over the course of a week. Uh, that um, that painting, Aegis, that I was talking about earlier, that, mm -hmm. where I was collecting, that, that was about um, six weeks. Uh, I do lots of paintings all at once. I have two six foot paintings I'm working on right now. Um, a few medium sized paintings, some small paintings. Um, so they can actually take a long time um, in the grand scheme of things. But if we're talking about actual work hours, it would be around that, yeah. Okay. Uh, is that, Aegis, that circular painting, is that a, on a panel or is it a canvas? It's on linen, yeah, Belgian linen, lead prime. All right. Um, how do you do the circle? Is the frame, like the stretcher bars, is that the circle or is it, it's... Yeah, how does that work? Oh, it's gl it's glued on gator board. Ah, uh, it's glued. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, right, Evan Thomas Lilly on Instagram says, "What kind of white do you use?" Uh, titanium white. Titanium white. Okay. All right. Yeah. Do you have a favorite color palette that you always start with? Yeah, my palettes have changed. Currently, my palette is um, ivory black, titanium white. Lizard and crimson, lemon and yellow, and ultramarine blue. That's it. That's it. Wow, that's that's very impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a particular medium you like to use? Um, obviously, 
uh, well, I, I love oil, oleo gel. Oil, oleo gel is great. Um, Jamsol. Um, and again, I've been painting with the egg tempura lately, and uh, I really enjoy that. I'm going to yeah, I meant to ask you, what, what attracted you to egg tempura? It's from anything I've, I haven't done it myself, so I don't know. But anyone I've talked to about it, it's, it seems grueling, like really unforgiving and very hard. And you have to really know what you're going to do in advance and just difficult. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I really, I'm, a, I'm not a huge fan of my own work. Um, and I think a lot of artists are very critical of their own work, you know. Uh, and so I, I critique myself constantly. And one of my critiques for my work was, um, I almost felt like they're, uh, too, too bright, you know, and, and too colorful. Um, and some people who, I, who have said, said that to have disagreed, but it just felt, it just felt like, um, you know, we live in this world where there's all these photographs and things are so bright and, and in your face and poppy. And I just felt sick of it, sick of it all. You know, I, I just wanted something that felt less bold. Um, and I'll see oil paintings who will, that will have, that will be very tonalist, right? And, um, but that wasn't really what I wanted either. I really wanted a painting to feel almost like a dream or a memory. And whenever I look at egg tempura paintings, that's what I see. I see this, this subdued um, memory. And um, that's what initially brought me to it. And I, I had just a theory that it would uh, give me the desired effect. And I think, I think it does. Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, good. It's good when that happens, isn't it? When you have an idea and then it, it actually turns out to be what yeah, you hoped it would be. Yeah, look at this, right. <laughs> um, did you finish answering about mediums or was there anything more you wanted to say about it? Yeah, oleo gel, um, Gamsol. Yeah. Uh, that's about it. Okay. And favorite type of brush, make of brush, shape of brush? I'm, I'm no... Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. I, I'll go to, you know, I'll, I'll have a kind of a wrist test where I'll just flick it against my wrist um, and see if I like it. Uh, you know, it seems like more br bristly, um, natural, natural hair brushes are great for covering large swaths. And um, if I want to do some more finished work, I, I like them to be a little bit softer and uh, We'll go for a synthetic brush or just something that feels uh, a little bit lighter to the to, to my skin. All right. And shape wise, does it matter? Um, primarily rounds, some fan brushes, and uh, that's mostly it. I'll, I'll have a couple square brushes, but uh, primarily rounds and fan brushes. All right. And what kind of palette do you have? Uh, New Wave. New Wave palette, wood palette. Is that the vertical one? No, I, I hold it, you know, um, just holding my, my arm. So is that wooden or plastic or? Yeah, it's, uh, it's wood. It's wooden. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, how do you check yourself as you're working? You know, like some artists, they'll turn the canvas upside down, they'll uh, take pictures with their phone, or they'll use mirrors a lot, or they'll get their friends in to give them some critiques, or email their friends. What sort of things do you do? Yeah, uh, my my uh, my family will give me plenty of input whether i ask it or not <laughs> which is which is great I, I love it and i i welcome it they're 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 great um and i appreciate their input and, and often it's it's correct um and do you and mean like correct. your wife and your sons or do you mean your brothers and sisters as well uh brothers sisters wife um okay all of them right uh and on top of that i'll 
um, look in a mirror, I'll take pictures with my phone, I'll turn it upside down, turn out the lights a lot. That's actually a real big one is turning out the lights. And, you know, once it has that vibrating feel, if I can feel that, I know, I know I'm on the right track, right? It's yeah. glowing, it's vibrating, it's, there's something about it. Yeah. What's your varnishing preference? Uh, Gambar. Just use Gambar gloss Gambar. varnish. But I got you got to be careful. It can sometimes get too glossy. Um, so, uh, you know, you can you can mix it with some um, satin as well if you need to. But usually, I just go straight gloss. Yeah. All right. And what kind of lighting setup do you have in your studio? Oh, I have tons of just. Uh, well, I have I have some big windows, so I have mostly natural light during the day, and then I have some big LED lights that you know get as close to natural light as I can. Very good. And do you listen to anything um, when you're painting? The John Dalton podcast, of course. Well, um, that goes without saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, I go through different stuff. You know, I used to listen to like the news um, and I, I don't do that anymore just because, you know, it can just get you in a bad mood. Um, and so I will listen to just some instrumental music or nothing mostly now. Yeah. So my podcast, music or nothing. That's, that's, that's right. That's a recipe for success right there. I agree. John <laughs> <laughs> um, Maria Radon on Patreon. Thanks for the tea. Maria says, hi, John's. <laughs> um, I love the ephemeral mystical appearance of John's portraits. Uh, when I was much younger and used colored pencils to create art, I played with putting various colors really close to each other as a way to fill space in an interesting way, making colors vibrate. These paintings remind me of colored pencils. I wonder if John has ever used colored pencils or pastels in this way. I was influenced by the Impressionists at the time, of course, and John's modern slash unique take on pointillism is very intriguing and inspiring to me. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, remind me the beginning of that question. Could you read the beginnings? She was asking about colored pencils. Have you ever used colored pencils and putting colors beside each other, which I've seen from yes. the close-ups that okay. you do that kind of thing, putting colors beside uh, each other to yeah. you know, op optical mixing or getting the colors to vibrate together, that kind of thing. Yes. So, so yeah, um, optical mixing, you know, it's, it's no secret. It's a, it's a fantastic technique to just put raw bits of color next to each other and you do get a vibration and it feels very uh, luminous. Um, yes, I have, have used color pencils, uh, mostly in high school and, um, uh, some of the egg tempura paintings can have that feeling of almost a, a colored pencil feel because it's the paint when you put it down is so linear. Um, it just seem it just will go. So, uh, so it, so it almost feels like, um, if you were to, to melt colored pencils, uh, it kind of feels that way on the brush. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. I've, I love colored pencils. I haven't done them since, uh, for, for a very, very long time. Uh, I think they're great medium. I, maybe I should do some more. I think it's great. Um, and I'd, I'd love to see your paintings or your, your drawings. <laughs> and, um, Maybe just talk a little bit about pointillism because um, it's not that common and it's something that you have, you do. Yeah. Um, well, pointillism, I feel like, again, going back to that idea of accents, um, I will always, I, I approach a painting like most people will, approach a painting or at least kind of the generic um you know tiling laying down the form the pointillism is the last phase where I'm, I'm just going that extra mile right where i feel like just one dot of color can change the feel the feel to uh, my subject and i i started noticing that when i was 
drawing in the figure drawing uh, room in school that if I put like just one dash or one dot, I could achieve the subtlety of pop or or um, emphasis that I wanted. And so um, that's really what it is, is this desire to um, put that extra oomph, that extra grab to get that figure, to get that subject out, coming out at you and really popping. And um, I use, I use it almost like a glaze, right? Where hmm. you glaze to to tint something or or to change it slightly. Um, it's the same concept, except you know, I'm not I'm not glazing. I'm just putting those accents in those moments um, of emphasis. And the radiance that comes, that that vibration that I was talking about, where you know, I'll I'll, I'll put it in my room and once I, with the lights out and I feel that vibration, the radiance that can be achieved from that me method of of careful careful consideration um, is very appealing to me. Um, listening to you describe it, um, is it is it just like one point, one little dot, or do you do um, a series of them? Because looking at some of the close ups, um, there's like from from you know, far away, it's like, oh, that's an eye, for example. But when you look at it really closely, it seems like there's a series of little dots. Which do you do, or, both, or is it both? Um, I mean, it's tons of dots. Yeah, it's tons I of mean, dots. Yeah. It, okay. And uh, or 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 strokes, or dashes, or um, smudges. It doesn't pointillism. Um, pointillism. It, it, it depends what the subject calls for, right? Um, it's not exclusively dots. Um, sometimes, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of mess it into the to the flesh a little bit um, with strokes or something like that. But the concept is, um, yes, those those small bits of broken color, um, I will I'll do and I'll do them pretty rapidly, um, except maybe for the final final moments, right? If I if I want to maybe bring the nose a little bit forward, make it pop towards the viewer just a little bit, maybe I'll put, you know, a piece of warm or high chroma color on my brush and put one, two dots, three dots, giving a extra, uh, the illusion of it coming towards the viewer just a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, Maria has another question. She says, another thing I always wonder about other painters is whether journaling or writing is part of their creative process and if so, to what extent? Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. I write down some thoughts um, behind paintings and, and why I want to, why I even want to, you know, put in the time to create the painting. Um, and um, but it's, it's never like long paragraphs or papers or anything like that, maybe, or excuse me, long papers. It's more so just, you know, a paragraph or so um, of what I'm thinking about. Uh, but mostly I'll just have an image in my head and hammer, hammer it away and move things around <laughs> more than anything. But the verbal written um, method definitely helps you narrow in those ideas and those thoughts very good and how do you name your paintings um i don't know i just i just think about it uh, i'll think about phrases words maybe i'll put put like um you know i've, I've maybe even thought of like feelings and i've searched you know the dictionary to see different um words that correlate with those feelings um or just I, it just comes to me as i'm looking at the painting and thinking about it and does it happen when the painting's finished or before it starts or is there a 
definitive wow. I'd say mostly like near the end when I'm thinking about it the most and you're kind of scrambling and and you're very frazzled those final you know that's the hardest part is the very end of a painting and um because you're like this is this is it this is over you know I gotta I gotta really really get after it um and and in those quiet moments where you know you're you're kind of breathing a little bit slower, calming down, looking at the painting. Those moments, I'll, I'll think about what are we going to call you? What are we going to name you? Um, yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. Veronica Winters in Florida, former podcast guest, says, um, what do you want to say with your painting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question because um, I think when I was young, a little bit younger, you know, I mean, I'm fairly young in my career as it is, but even younger, let's say I'm 32, um, I would be a lot about, or even as a student, it's a lot about what I can do, you know, look, look what I can do a little bit. And then every artist knows that as, as they develop into the career and find out what they want to make, it becomes more like, what, what, what do I want to reveal? Um, and I can't say that every painting is the same. Like, I wish I could say John Darley is saying this about all my, all my work, you know, this is, this is this is my brand, you know, to use a a um, catchy catchy phrase. Uh, but each painting has its own objective, and I th- feel like most paintings that are successful are about something, even if it's a simple thing. Um, and when I'm painting for a client, which is often the case. Um, and I'm doing a portrait, I'm thinking about that person and who they are and um, what future generations that they show to their children will think about that painting and what it will represent to, to not only them, but um, to their children and their children's children, like a, 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 a generational message. Um, and then when it comes to my work, I'm just really talking about my life and my emotions at that time and state. Um, so kind of two different, uh, messages or two different objectives, I suppose, depending on the painting. Yeah. So in your own paintings, it, it doesn't sound like you're, you're trying to get a message across. You're just trying to, uh, express it's more of an act of expression. Like I'm just, this is what's going on for me. Whereas, um, with the portraits, it sounds like it's more, you're trying to um, capture the essence of the person as best you can in the painting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and with my personal work, I wouldn't even, I would say, I would say almost it's like, I'm more so having a conversation with the painting, right? And I, I actually do feel like I might be a crazy person because I will, in my head, like talk to these paintings and like have these discussions with them and, and these conversations where I'm trying to like physically work out in a tangible way, how I feel and say what I don't have the ability to say, you know, when I was a boy, this was a very common thing I would do. And again, this is what I felt I had respect for, I have respect for Odd Nerdrum for is because I feel like he does this um, so naturally. Um, but that that moment where you go and you're just trying to draw because you, you, want, you want control over this feeling that you have and you want to see it and you want to, and you want others to see it 
and to understand it um, and having that physical thing that you can work out and bring to life and then show it to the world and have other people criticize it or, or relate to it or um, want it is, it's really cool. It's, it's what I aim for when I'm paying for my own personal projects for galleries or wherever it's going to go. Yeah. So did you, did you find it soothing as a kid? Like, you know, because what, what I'm hearing you say, maybe it's not what you're saying, but what I'm hearing is um, that you were uh, drawing as a way of making sense of and in a way trying to control a situation that didn't make sense and was out of your control. So I'm yeah, wondering if, if, the, if, the, if the act of drawing actually soothed you in some way. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like I said, I went to all these different schools. Um, I would, I, you know, I'd, I'd get in school scuffles on a very regular basis. Um, and I, you know, I was, I was going to these schools that were in rich neighborhoods, but my family was in these financial difficulties. And in some ways, you know, little kids, they can smell it, you know, they, they can smell it. And, and, uh, and it forced me to deal with these emotions in any way I could, you know, I was always uncomfortable in my own skin just because I felt like I, um, I didn't understand, I just didn't understand exactly what was going on. I didn't understand why my parents were stressed out, um, you know, and, or, or why, why this or why that, um, or why it seemed like I could never do anything right. I was always, you know, I, I think, I think in early junior high, I went to, I think I went to in school suspension, like at least once a month, you know, for, for whatever shenanigans I was doing. Um, and I, you know, I think it was funny because that, that, um, that, per, that lady, what I, I would always go to was like, we became good buddies, you know, and I loved going because I would just draw. And I think I ended up going to those in school suspensions because I would just draw and not, that's just what I would want to do and, or disrupt somebody and, or, 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 you know, do some sort of disruptive shenanigans, anything to stimulate my, my, my mind um, was something I would do. And I, I'm not saying like, poor me, like, Oh, you know, I, you know, my, my childhood's hard. My childhood was absolutely fine. You know, I wasn't, you know, it was great, but, um, but I'm just saying the, these were my methods of kind of coping and, and, and working it out uh, as a child and still today as an adult, right? You, you know, you, you, you have emotions and you have thoughts and ideas and everybody has them. And it's like, what do you, what are you supposed to do with them? Right. And a lot, a lot of people have different ways of handling it. Right. Uh, cold showers. Right. Or, or, um, you know, maybe people get really into like the pursuit of, um, you know, getting, getting really jacked at the gym or, or um, whatever. Yet you have them. And some people have them more intensely than others, but you got to do something with it. Right. And I think for a lot of artists, it's, uh, it's the medium of paint. It's the medium of, of drawing or whatever. And for me, I mean, as a kid, it was pretty much drawing and fighting. I got in tons of little, little kid fights that were just, you know, little scaffolds. Um, and as you know, and as you become older, that's, you don't do that. You know, you have to learn how to take your emotions and, and apply them to the marketplace and to the public in a way that's accepted by others. And, uh, uh but th those, st those emotions, um, were abs are absolutely present even today in where it's me working out what I'm feeling and trying to make sense and also thinking about the, 
you know, people before me, people, the, the present and, you know, what the future will look like. Very good. Um, what's the last piece of art you bought? An Ansel Adams print was the last piece of art that I bought of the Tetons, which is lovely. I love his work. Um, I've been in discussions with my neighbor, Ben Hammond, I'm trying to get him to get, give me one of his sculptures that I, <laughs> he won't give me, but maybe, maybe we can do a trade or I gotta, I gotta save up for it. Cause um, I, we were in a show together recently um, and I, I was walking around and I saw this sculpture. I think it was of, of his wife because it, it has the anatomical stru bone structure or facial structure of his wife, but it seems like maybe he manipulated it a little bit to uh, be a, more of an ambiguous female. But it's just of her pregnant. Um, and there's just maybe it's the stage of life I am with you know young babies, but there's just something so beautiful about, you know, pregnancy and, and you know women who are you know, about to give birth that and and the sculpture was just it was just stunning to me and I, I have I have a place in my home and in my yard where I, ha I want different uh, sculptures and, and artwork and I'm trying to I'm trying to get a, get a plan together to make it happen <laughs> so maybe maybe him and I can do a trade or something but I want I want that sculpture it's gonna be mine <laughs> very good um, what practical tips do you have for balancing uh, parenthood and being an artist? Like, how have you made it work? I mean, it's difficult, um, but it's but at the same time, it's easy. Um, it's easy in that motivation to paint and to work is not an issue. I don't waste any time at all. Um, hundred percent on whenever I'm at the at the easel um it's difficult in that you know you're 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 just just practical stuff like i i, I clean the floors like a hundred times a day it seems like there's just goo places you know <laughs> it's like weird weird uh messes and stuff but the, the biggest tip i would give somebody who wants to have children and to be a painter um or to be an artist is to um be, be on when you're on with your children and be on when when it's game time for painting um, and try to consolidate the two as best as you can as best you can um, for me I work my, my wife she works part-time she has a part-time hourly job where she'll work from 8 to 12 and then I will work from about 12 to about to, to about seven is kind of the schedule we have. And so we'll just kind of tag team with one another. And there's some real cool and sweet moments with that system where, you know, sometimes I'll allow my kids to be in my studio. I mean, I'm kind of weird about it. Sometimes I feel like I want, it's okay. And sometimes it's not um, just based off how I feel, but sometimes it's really cool. You know, my son, when he's drawing, with me or my wife is she's reading books to my kids as I'm painting. I mean, it really is the dream in, in some ways. I mean, it's, it's real wealth, you know, you, you get to, um, if you can be an artist and have children and make it work, I mean, I guess making it work is, oh, <laughs> you never know, but, um, things can always happen uh, and change your situation. But, uh, it's it's really fantastic my kids and parenting are um they are my they are in a way my art i mean raising children is an incredibly creative thing and um i get the same feelings and almost like a vibration when when i'm seeing their little minds figure out stuff as you're teaching them and, and as you're uh, at the same time making progress on paintings. So I guess my biggest tip would be to um, enjoy it, enjoy the journey, enjoy the the, the chaos and um, let all of that fuel you uh, 
into your creative process and, and into your paintings at it. Um, it's wonderful. Kids are kids and children are 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 definitely something that I don't think should be um, shunned or or something you you don't pursue because you're scared. It's something you want to do, and you want to be a painter and you want to be an artist. Definitely go for it. Um, yeah, hundred percent. Lovely. Um. Okay, you're, this is my desert island question. You're on a desert island. No one is coming. Um, all your food and shelter is taken care of, so you don't have to do anything to do with that. And there are art supplies there. Would you still make paintings that no one was ever going to see except yourself? Oh, yeah, 100%. That's such a great question, John. I love that question um, because I feel like that is the question in, in that the sun is going to go out eventually. This planet might eventually look like Mars. The universe will go into a black hole. All of this is temporary. <laughs> you know, it's all temporary. None of us are getting out of this alive, right? And painting and, or and painting or really whatever our professions or our pursuits are, we are learning. We are growing from the, those activities. And I think that's, at least from my perspective, that's what we take. That's the only thing we can take is what we learn and those experiences and that growth. Um, and paintings for me are, you know, a, a, a way to speak, a way to serve, but most importantly, in my mind, a way for, for me to grow and to push myself and to um, take whatever whatever knowledge I, I gain from it into the next life. So absolutely, I would. Yeah. Um, that's lovely. Do you think they would be the same or do you think you would paint different things if you, you know? which is there on your own and no one was going to ever see them, but you. Mm. I'm not sure. I think, I definitely think that would be different. Yeah, I do. And that's just because, um, it's because if I was in that situation, I would have different thoughts. I would have different objectives. I would have um, different emotions. And um, I think there would probably be a little bit of part of me, a little part of me that would say, you know, maybe, maybe there's, you know, maybe somebody will see this painting, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe somebody in the next life or maybe, uh, maybe uh, some, 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 there's a boat that will see it, you know, there's a little message in the bottle or something like that. But yeah, no, I think I would do something different because that would be a different circumstance. And I would also, um, I would, I would hope that my work today, regardless of being on a desert island, will be different. My, the work that I'm going to be doing in 2023 is not going to be the work that I did in 2022. It's not going to be the work that I did in 2021. I'm always growing, and um, and I would be disappointed if if that wasn't the state, you know, the, the case this year or on a desert island. Yeah, yeah. If there was one underlying theme to all your work, what do you think it would be? Just the people around me. Um, the West, where I live. Um, and how I feel. <laughs> really, really, I mean, what I feel like oh, and, and a ton of 
and a, a, a ton of uh, mistakes for sure <laughs> as well and lessons. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would say uh, the people around me, the land around me and my life. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Elham Isari on Instagram says, Dear John, how, if ever, do you manage rejection in the art world? And also, do you ever experience self-doubt? And if you do, how do you deal with it? I added that last bit on in the end. <laughs> I like that. That's a great question. I mean, there's so many ways I could uh, approach this. Let me think. Well, first of all, who cares? I mean, people are going to not like your work. 100%. I mean, there's so many. I'm sure there's people who don't like my work. I mean, maybe they'll even comment on this, you know, and I mean, what are you going to do about it? Um, you just move on. The second thing is, um, yeah, that stuff motivates me. You know, uh, I'm very much so motivated by people not liking my work, not liking me. Um, you know, and, uh, and that sounds weird, but it, it's, it adds fuel to the fire. And the third thing is, um, there's nobody who is a, who dislikes their work more than probably me. Like I'm very critical about my work and, um, it's hard for me to look at because there's so many aspirations I have and so many places I want to take it. And I'm, I see, I see where it is often. And, um, you know, it can, it can frustrate you because you know what you could, what you can do and, and what you are going to do. And it's not there where you want it yet. And that's part of the fun and that's part of the hunt. But, um, yeah, if there's somebody more critical than myself, um, it, it'd just be surprising. Um, and the, and then I'll, I'd add to that too. When, when I get those feelings of um, things, you know, anxiety or self doubt, I mean, you just you just swallow it up and eat it, kind of. You just sit in it and you face it, and. Um, you know, when I, I mean, now it's like I said, you know, I, I, I surfed, I proselyted for my church as a missionary. And you're, I mean, you were rejected every day. I mean, most people are really cool, though. And, um, and most people are just so beautiful inside and out and um, very humble and gracious. Um, but you do face on a regular basis in those, you know, those proselyting situations, um, tons of rejection, but you have to become comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Uh, and you have to be comfortable in an incredibly weird and awkward thing to do. Um, yeah, I remember, I remember the first time I ever spoke to somebody as, as a missionary for my church, it was, it was so weird. It's like, what am I, every sense in you, in, you, in your body is saying, this is weird. This is weird. This is not socially accept acceptable. This is weird. Um, and so all your natural instincts are to, like, not go up to somebody and talk to them about, like, God or the meaning of life. Which, by the way, I will say is a fascinating and unbelievably insightful thing to do that and speak with people you've never met and you probably would never meet or talk to had you not been in that circumstances uh, circumstance it's it's very insightful but i remember the first guy he was it was so i served in as a missionary in philadelphia i, I lived on broad and gerard um and, and then i went to for and i did that for about a year and then other places in pennsylvania but this guy it was on Halloween. He was wearing a white tuxedo, and he, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. And he, and and he had a, he dyed his afro green, and I just felt like I want I needed to talk to this guy. I was like, man, I gotta go do it. But again, that natural instinct goes into you. You're like, don't don't do it. 
Um, but I went to him. I was like, hey, you know, I don't remember what I said. A guy ended up being like already like a, a member of my church and he like fallen into some sort of drug addiction. It was actually a very obvious, like positive experience because, you know, he uh, oh, I think I think it was it was a good thing for him. And he, he started taking some steps to get that taken care of. But um, but that feeling was so weird and I hated it. And I had to face that every day for a long time. And I think the answer to that question is you can't run away from resistance. And it's carried on into the art world where I've, you know, I've been rejected from, you know, maybe maybe there's an artist who says something negative that you respect about you, or maybe um, maybe a gallery rejects you or something like that. But um, the only the only way is to to pursue and go through those those feelings and press forward. That's the only option. The other option is to just like resign to defeat. And that's not an option. It's just not. Um, and so my answer to that is, you know, you get rejected, keep going, be successful, move forward. And those feelings just sit in them and become comfortable being uncomfortable and, um, and, and, and face those emotions front on. Yeah. Very good. How have you got on with the business side of the art world? It's been okay for me. Um, it, it's a weird thing being self-employed in general. Um, you really need to not have any debt if you want to be an artist, in my view. Um, we've, we've been very careful about keeping our finances clean in that way. Uh, the only money we've borrowed is for our home. Um, and that's been a, an incredible advantage um, because you have to be scrappy. Um, and so, you know, what will usually happen is I'll get some commissions and I'll pay for living for, you know, maybe three, four, five months. Um, and then once that dries up, and I don't have anything, we, you know, you live off savings for a little bit until you get something, something else has kind of been my circumstance right now. And my wife has, um, she has a part time job. And that kind of is a reliable, stable situation. And I also have a, a class that I teach. And that's kind of a reliable stream. But you do what you have to, um, to make it work. And uh, artists are so clever and creative. They figure out so many cool ideas to do what they want to do anyways. Um, so for me, it's been a lot of commissions. Gallery work, I um, avoided at the beginning because I I couldn't put the, the, the numbers didn't make any sense. I didn't, my paintings didn't call for the prices I needed to be able to sell in a gallery and live. So I went exclusively after private collectors and through word of mouth. Um, and I did it pretty aggressively. And um, that is really how I got got the start. Now, now I'm at a stage where my paintings can sell for, for enough where a gallery would be worth it and is worth it. And I work with a few, but, um, but word of mouth is very strong and, um, and whatever you can do where you can envision a path where you can financially make it work is probably the, what, you, what you should pursue, right? And everyone's circumstance is a little bit different. Right. Um, where, where, how did you find the collectors? And then when you say you pursued them, what did you actually do? <laughs> yeah. Um, I've, I've literally just emailed people before I've made propositions. Um, I, so Instagram, you know, Instagram, usually you get, you don't get serious collectors. I have had a number of actual serious collectors, uh, contact me through that, through Instagram. Um, and then, but the biggest and strongest one is word of mouth, 100%, you know, and usually they'll come from other collectors, right? You know, um, and yeah, word of mouth, biggest, social media is great, but word of mouth is probably the, the most powerful tool, I would, I would have to say. Very good. 
you have a big art dream you'd like to achieve before you die? Yeah, hundred percent. I would. Um, I want to do large scale narrative multi figure paintings um, with a cohesive theme, um, without having to um, stop and go uh, to survive. To just be able to drill through that and tell stories um, that are applicable to the past, the present, and the future. Um, and uh, I'd like it to be displayed in a public space um, indefinitely, right? <laughs> I, I, that is, that's what I aim for and hope will happen. Wow, that's brilliant and very specific, which is very good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, this is my last question. I ask this to everyone who comes on the podcast. If there's one thing you could pass on to future generations, what would it be? Yeah, um, just work like your life depends on it, because it does. Uh, do everything you can to make um, your reality happen, um, because it goes by so fast. Uh, and like I said before, none of us are going to get out of this alive. And pretty soon, you know, I'm 32, pretty soon I'm going to be 60, pretty soon my kids are going to be grown up. And the time that we have is so limited. Um, and social media is great. It's a great tool. But uh, but be careful where, where your time gets spent and, and dries up. Um, and really allocate your time towards the things that matter you, to you, matter most to you. Um, and that will be of most benefit to not only you, but to, you know, your children and their children and their children, etc. And it brings honor to the people who have sacrificed for you, right? So uh, work hard <laughs> and use your time well, I guess, to sum that up. Yeah. Yeah, lovely. That's nice. Um... I hadn't thought about that, bringing honor to the people who've sacrificed for you. That's very good. Yeah. Um, okay, that's great. Look, I think your paintings are fantastic. I really enjoy them. They have a luminous quality, and I was wondering how you got it. And I think you said it when you were talking about your ministry, and you were saying that all people are beautiful both inside and out. And I was like, ah, okay, there it is. Because it's like um, you managed to infuse this quality into your um, paintings of, um, it's like you, you know, not in a saccharine way, but you sort of, all, all the paintings I've seen of the people, it's like the best of them. Um, I, I've never met any of them, but I sort of have a feeling that what you've represented is the best of them. Um, and they all have that very lovely, um, well, it's when I say glowing, I don't mean optically glowing. Um, I mean the, the energy of who they are is uh, comes across. And uh, they're lovely. I mean, technically, they're fantastic. And this thing you do with the pointillism is pretty mind-blowing, particularly if you're listening, if you uh, go to John's uh, Instagram and look at some of the close-ups. It's amazing. It really is amazing um, what you're doing. And it's, um, yeah, been lovely to kind of get to know you as a person and hear where you're coming from with it and all your, you know, your very earnest dedication to your craft. It's very inspiring um and yeah it's been lovely chatting with you thank you so much john i i've really enjoyed this conversation and um i hope i hope we can stay in touch um you know you i think what you've done with this podcast um and what you've provided people is incredibly valuable so thank you thank you for this opportunity thank you for that uh thank you for um Thank you for the hair. I, I love that you've been uh, growing that and <laughs> rocking that. that. That's so awesome. I mean, it's beautiful. beautiful. You're a beautiful man, John Dalton. You're a beautiful oh, man. Thank you. That's lovely. That's lovely. Well, yes, I do. I do keep in touch with everyone uh, for Zoom, tea or coffee or whatever. So, yeah, I'm sure we'll keep in touch. But, yeah, we'll say goodbye for now. Okay. John, it's so great speaking with you. We'll talk to you later. 
Thank you. Bye-bye. I've never felt this good in my entire life. Make me some spaghetti. Actually, I'd prefer a cup of tea. <laughs> a cup of tea would be lovely. So, yeah, just a little reminder. Mainly because every second or third person who becomes a patron has got in touch with me and said, you know what, I've been listening to your podcast for ages and I didn't become a patron, not because I don't have the money, not because I don't think it's great, I just didn't get around to it. So this is a little friendly reminder that if you'd like to be a patron, you'd like to buy me a cup of tea, go to patreon.com forward slash John Dalton, gently does it, all one word, or follow the link in the show notes to become a patron. I would really appreciate it if you could do that, particularly if you've been meaning to and you just haven't got around to it. It would be great. It would mean a lot to me. All right. Thank you. Bye. We are the Argyle Pimps. So buy us a drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimps. So buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. Come on, buy us a drink. We are the Argyle Pimps. So buy us a drink. We're better than you thought, but not as good as we think. We are the Argyle Pimps.